nearly every single day, I know weekly, but nearly every single day, I ask my wife two to three questions. Okay, two to three questions, they're the same exact questions, and she gets to roll her big beautiful eyes at me every time I ask it. She gets mad at me every time I ask it because she's like, Austin, you've asked me this same question over and over and over, and I just, I just don't seem to learn. Any other guys in the house that just don't seem to learn? Or maybe the women are like, hey, he doesn't learn, right, okay? Uh, so I'm in that boat. My, my first question that I ask Sarah almost every single day is simply this. Sarah, babe, where did you put my keys? Any other guys have a wife that likes to hide your keys, okay? Like, that's my wife. She likes to come along behind me and grab my keys and put them somewhere that I didn't put them, okay? And uh, whether that's a drawer or a hook or whatever. And she always looks at me when I say, where are my keys? Where did you put my keys? With the same exact answer, she says, Austin, they're supposed to be on the hook right at the door. When you come in, you put your keys on the hook. And I'm like, yes, mother, okay, mother dearest, I will, I will start to obey you. And, and, uh, and, and so she tells me where to put the keys, and nearly every single time I'm looking for the keys, and I find my keys in my back pocket of the jeans I wore right before, right? Because uh, I'm a dude, when I come into the house, my pants come off, okay? And, um, and so, so I find my keys in the pant pocket. And then the second question that I ask my wife all the time is simply this, um, Sarah, babe, where is my wallet? Because I know you married me for my money, okay? I know you've got it, right? Gold digger, uh, marrying a pastor for money. She's, she's crazy. And, uh, and so I ask her, where's my wallet? And she looks at me again. She's like, Austin, where does your wallet go? To which I really have no idea because I still don't know where my wallet goes. And uh, where do I find my wallet? I find my wallet in the pants that I took off in the front pocket, right? Because my, my wallet is always getting lost. My keys are always getting lost. And there's a third question that I used to ask her all the time until about a year ago. And here's the question I asked her all the time. Sarah, babe, honey, sweetie, darling, will you call my phone? I can't find my phone. <laughs> and my phone was always on vibrate, right? Because you didn't want to be that guy that your phone just starts ringing. So I have it on vibrate all the time. And so I have to tell everybody, Sarah's calling my phone. Okay, everybody quiet. I got to get on the ground and listen, you know, try to listen for the, the stampede that's coming. Where's my phone? I got to find the vibration, where, where to go or whatever. And I had to ask her that all the time. Anybody else have, have this thing where you ask somebody to call your phone? Anybody. Let's say uh, you do it at least once a month. Who does that at least once a month? Okay. What about once a week? Okay. How about on the daily? Yes. Okay, the altar will be open uh, as soon as service is over. We can pray over you that you, you are better at finding your phone, right? And so I, I would ask her to call my phone. She would call my phone, and it would be awesome until about a year ago. And about a year ago, I stopped asking her this question because I got an Apple Watch. Now, when I first got my Apple Watch, I, was, I loved it. I, I loved all the bells and whistles on it. I could check Facebook, like, oh, wow, Facebook, it's so cool, you know. I could get uh, notifications when, when I wanted to take a, a group selfie. Who hasn't wanted to do this? You could start a timer on your watch, and your phone would interact with your watch. It was so cool, and all the bells and whistles. And all that stuff, let me be completely honest with you, it wore off quick. Okay. All the bells and whistles, I don't even use it anymore. The one thing I use my Apple Watch for the most is this little feature called a ping. So anytime my phone is lost, all I got to do is go up in my Apple Watch and do this. Now that is handy. That single feature has saved my marriage. Okay, so... There's a little marriage advice, get an Apple Watch, okay? And, uh, and so, so I, I would hit the ping, and then my phone would, even if it was on vibrate, if it was low battery, it didn't matter, the ping will go off, and I will go find it wherever it is, usually in my pants pocket. And I would find my phone, and it was, it was awesome. And, and there's many things, I think, that we lose in our life. Like, you may uh, really lose your keys a lot. You may lose your wallet a lot. You may lose your kids a lot. I don't know your life. Whatever it is, fill in your blank of things that you lose. But I think really on a deeper basis, like all of us, all of us, we find ourselves losing something that's very, very, very valuable in our life. And today I want to talk about something that I feel like 
I've lost in my life unnecessarily, and I really believe that you've probably lost it in your life unnecessarily as well. The, the thing that I, I find many people misplace, just like I misplace my phone or my wallet or my keys, the thing that many of us misplace more than almost anything else is simply our peace. Our peace. I think a lot of times in our life, especially in America, we, we live our lives based on our, our circumstances, right? So when it's good, baby, it's good. And when it's bad, it's really bad. And then when it's good, it's good. When it's bad, it's bad. But there's not a constant sense of peace that a lot of us can live with in our lives. And the peace I'm talking about is not, I'm not talking about the peace that you get when, when you uh, make that big sale and then you're able to pay off that creditor that's been on your back for months. Like that feeling you get at the end of that, like, yes, I got that guy off my back. Get out of my life. You know, yes. I'm not talking about that peace. I'm not talking about the piece where, you know, you're pregnant and you have a, a long pregnancy and then finally you have a baby and the baby comes out and is healthy and you feel peace at the end. I'm not talking about that piece. I'm not talking about the piece that, that you get when you get the new job that pays a little bit more money and you're able to do a little bit more stuff. I'm not talking about that piece. I, I'm talking about the piece that when you don't make the sale and when the creditor is on your back and they will not stop calling you and they will not stop sending you letters, the peace that you have even in the midst of that financial struggle. I'm talking about the peace that when you're pregnant and you don't know if the baby is going to make it, the doctor doesn't know whether you're going to have uh, carry this baby full term or not, the peace that you can have in the middle of that situation. I'm talking about the peace that you can have in the unemployment line when you don't have the job that you wanted. I'm talking about that kind of peace. Because it's easy for many of us to be happy and at peace when we're having happy situations in our life. What's harder is to carry the peace from the mountaintop down with us into the valley. And today, I want us to look at a passage of Scripture in Psalm chapter 23. Psalm chapter 23, where uh, King David is writing this psalm, and he's, he's writing it out, and it's, and it's beautiful, and you may have it on a coffee mug or a t-shirt, and you may claim this verse, and you may love this verse if you've been a Christian for very long. Like, you probably studied this in VBS. You maybe memorized this. You, you're all about this passage of Scripture, and it is an amazing passage of Scripture. But many times when we're preaching this or when we're reading this or when we're, we're studying this, many times we stop before the, the, the psalmist is done giving us an explanation. Psalm chapter 23 and verse 1. Psalm chapter 23 and verse 1, it says this. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even though I walk through the darkest, deepest valley, even though I'm in the middle of the darkest situation, the darkest circumstance of my entire life, my God is with me. Whether I'm, I'm walking on green pastures and by quiet waters, or I'm in the deepest, darkest valley where you can see nothing in front of you, God is with you. And if you're a Christian and you grew up in church, like you're, yeah, 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 that's awesome. But I want us today to take a step back and I want us to be honest. Because when we're in the deepest, darkest valley, many times when we are there, it's hard to bring the peace of God with us. Here's what I want us to see today. Simply this. The presence of peace is found in the presence of God. The presence of peace is found in the presence 
of God. If you want peace in your life, then you've got to have Jesus in your life. If you want peace in your life, you've got to have the Prince of Peace in your life. The presence of peace is found in the presence of God. See, many times we stop at verse 4. And we end the passage of Scripture, and it's awesome. God is with me in the dark times. God is with me in the good times. God is with me. God is with me. But I want to read on to the next two passages of Scripture, the next two verses, and show a little bit different side of this passage. Because I believe that this is where the psalmist is getting. This is what he says. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I want us to focus in on on verse number 5. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And here's what I want us to understand. When David says this, when King David says this, he's not talking about a democratic society where like, if he gets captured by his enemies, he's going to go on trial and then the jury is going to decide the verdict and he's going to either go to jail or he's going to be let go and go free. He's not talking about putting, being put in captivity. When David talks about being in the presence of his enemies where he is being surrounded by his enemies, what he's talking about is sure death. They're not going to take him captive and put him alongside of them. No, they're going to cut his head off. And what God does, what God does in this passage, what, what David says that God does in your life and in my life is that God will set a table, he will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. That he won't change your circumstance necessarily, but instead he'll start working and changing you. See, the presence of peace is found in the presence of God. Because if we are trusting in our circumstance, or our bank account, or our relationships, or our marriage, or our church attendance to keep us on the highest of highs and keep us out of the valley of the shadow of death, then, then we're going we're gonna to be running into some situations that are going to cause us to lose peace. But if we can start learning the presence of God, we can start accepting the presence of peace. There's three things I want us to see. Straight from chapter 23 and verse 5 about peace in our life. Number one is simply this. God's view is not always a new venue. God's view is not always a new venue. God's view doesn't always change your circumstance. You may find yourself in the darkest pit today and God changing you may not look like God taking you out of the darkest pit. God's view is not always a new venue. It says this, you, you prepare a place for me, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Imagine that. You're in the presence of your enemies and instead of God giving you a sword and a shield, God gives you a bowl of mac and cheese to pass on to the next one. He's sitting a table before you. A place of comfort, a place of rest in the middle of the darkness. He's not taking you out of the darkness. Think of it this way. If you read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the New Testament, you may walk away from those Gospels thinking something like this. If you read it with fresh eyes. You may walk away with something like this. Man, those disciples were the biggest dummies I've ever seen in my entire life. These dudes spent three years with the Son of God, with Jesus Christ, following Him miracle after miracle, town after town, seeing dead people raised from the dead, seeing deaf people have hearing again, seeing blind people get sight again, hearing Him say, I am going to sacrifice my life, and I'm going to pick it back up again, and I'm going to establish a new kingdom, not a kingdom of earth, but a kingdom of heaven here on earth, I'm going to do all those things, hearing him say all that, and then the most disappointed people of all the people at Jesus' death were who? 
the disciples. You would think, or at least I would think, if they traveled with him, if they'd seen all that, if they heard him say, I'm going to pick myself back up again, I'm not going to stay in the grave, I'm going to rise again, if they'd heard him say all that, you'd think that they'd be evangelists during the three days and say, listen, I know he's dead right now, but listen, he's coming back. But you know what they did? They ran and hid. Why did they do that? Here's why. Because they knew that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the one that was to come to save Israel and the world. They knew that. But their view of Messiah was wrong. Here's what their view of Messiah was. Their view of the Messiah coming was that he was going to come as a warrior with a sword and a shield to rescue them from the grip of the Roman Empire and he was going to set up a new, uh, new Israel and he was going to take them back to the promised land and he was going to vanquish all of their enemies and he was going to destroy them all and he was going to lead them forward into the future. That was their view of the Messiah. And instead... Jesus shows up on earth, and instead of bringing a sword and a shield as a warrior, Jesus came as a carpenter with a hammer and nails. And what I believe, get this, I believe this is why so many of us lose our peace as Christians. Many of us, when we find ourselves in the middle of a terrible situation, in the middle of death, in the middle of depravity, in the middle of, of something that we never, ever, ever thought would happen to us, when we find ourselves there, many of us, we expect Jesus to come into our life as a warrior to take us out of the situation and put us into green pastures, take us out of the valley of the shadow of death, and put us by quiet waters. When in fact, Jesus doesn't always come as a warrior. Sometimes he comes as a carpenter. Sometimes he comes with a hammer and nail, not to fix the situation, but to fix me and to fix you. And here's, here's, what, here's what David's saying in this passage. God is setting a table. He's preparing a table for you and for me in the presence of our enemies. That he's not going to necessarily take us out of the presence of our enemies, but he's going to set a place where we can focus on him in the presence of our enemies. And this is what he, this is what he does. He sets the table, and your enemies are at different seats around the table. And God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who laid down his life for you and for me, he's sitting at the head of the table, right? Sitting at the head of the table, and we're sitting here. And in order for us to have the peace of God, we've got to have the presence of God. And so in this moment, in this moment where he's setting the table in the presence of our enemies, if we are to move past the things in our life, we have first got to acknowledge the circumstances in our life. Before you can ever move past what's happened in your life, the circumstances, you've got to acknowledge them. Before you can put your focus on God, you've got to acknowledge that you're in the middle of some crap in your life right now. And here's, here's what I believe in this passage of Scripture. Here's what I believe we should do. Is acknowledge the enemies. Hey, hey, enemy. I see you right there. I just want to let you know. I know that you're sitting right there. Hey, hey, death. Hey, death, I know you're sitting at that seat right there. I can see you. Hey, hey cancer, I, I see you right there. I know what you're here for. I know why you're here. I can see you. Hey, hey miscarriage, I see you right there. I know that you're right there, and I, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not comfortable with cancer. I'm not comfortable with, the, with sickness. I'm not comfortable with death in this life. I'm not comfortable with the things that are sitting at my table, but, but I'm here to let you know that you may be a guest at the table, but you are not the head of the table because I know that goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because, look, Look, when you're sitting in the presence of your enemies and God is at the head of the table because, guess what? He owns the house. He's sitting at the, the head of the table and you're looking at God. I'm putting my focus not on the things around me, not on the circumstances I'm going through because they hurt. 
There's pain. When a family member dies, you experience pain. But you know what you can experience in the middle of pain? You can experience the presence of God. You can experience the presence of peace. The unexplainable presence of peace. But the only place that that's found is in the presence of God. Second thing that I see from this passage is this. What God anoints, what God anoints, we should guard. What God anoints, we should guard. It says in that passage of Scripture, you anoint my head with oil. Now, when he says that, he's not talking about like cocoa butter. He's not talking about like the, the oily stuff that I put on my head so that I don't go bald because I don't know if you've seen my dad or not. He gave announcements. Uh, he's really bald, okay? So I'm trying to keep my hair so every night and every morning I sprinkle a little oily stuff, forhims.com, all up on my scalp because I'm trying to keep my locks as long as I can, okay? No offense to you bald people in here, but forhims.com, it's awesome, okay? Uh, so he's not talking about cosmetic stuff. He's not talking about, hey, uh, let's make sure the sheep look good. David's a shepherd. So when he talks about anointing head with oil, he's talking about it from the perspective of a, she of a shepherd. What happened with sheep? Sheep would be attacked by flies, and, and this certain type of fly would plant itself inside the, the head of the sheep, and it would cause disease, infection, and ultimately lead to death. So what shepherds would do is they would anoint their head with oil so that when these crusty little flies would come up, they'd just slide right off. See, here, here's what I believe today. That there's some flies of negativity, there's some flies of circumstances that may be trying to get into your mind. Some stuff may, may be trying to plant its, itself inside of your mind and, and, and take your mind. Because if your mind is gone, th then your, your actions are gone. You, you can't outlive your thinking. And so when, when God anoints our head with oil, he's giving us the peace of God. We should guard that. In fact, the Apostle Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding... It transcends all understanding. When you're sitting in this seat and you've got stuff going on all around you, but somehow you have the peace of God, that transcends all understanding because it does not make sense. It doesn't make sense that in the middle of the worst day of your life, you still have some sort of peace. It transcends all understanding. This is what it says. It will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. This is what he says. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. You cannot outlive your thinking. It's a barrier. If negativity is all that you have in your life, that this circumstance that came into my life, and that's all my life will ever be, it will be a wall that you will hit over and over and over. You can be in the presence of your enemies and not be a captive to your enemies. Number three is this. God puts to use what we go through. God puts to use what we go through. Last thing he says is this. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. God puts to use what we go through. What, whatever you're going through today, the good, the bad, and the ugly, our God is big enough to put that thing to use. Here's, here's what I believe. I truly believe that no matter what you've gone through in your life, nothing is wasted. I believe that so much that the first tattoo I ever got first tattoo I ever got was a chest piece that says, nothing is wasted. And the first summer, I was that guy with only words on my chest as my first tattoo, and everyone made fun of me, okay? I believed it anyways. All they're making fun of me, it wasn't wasted, okay? Nothing is wasted. Whatever you've gone through, whatever's been done to you, it's not wasted because God 
wants to use it in and through your life. There's two ways that that God does this. See, he says in this passage of scripture, my cup overflows. My cup overflows. That even in the midst of darkness, even as I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death, my cup overflows not because of something I have done, but because of my God. Because my God loves me and he's going to take care of me and my cup is overflowing. But when your cup overflows, the question we have to ask ourselves is now what? Because now my cup is full. Now what? I think there's two ways that God wants us to use what he's placed inside of us, what we've gone through, how he wants to change other people's lives. And the first one is through people that don't know Jesus. Because get this, the people you work with every single day, the people in your family, if they do not know Jesus, they don't know true and lasting peace. And you've seen it in their life. When, when, they, when payday comes, they're having a good day. When it's the end of the month and they're waiting on payday, it's a bad day. Good day, bad day. Good day, bad day. There's, there's no level peace in their life because they don't know Jesus. And what happens in my life and what happens in your life, when you are sitting at the table and there's, there is all kinds of stuff that's happened to you. You've been molested. You've been raped. You, you've had, had a child that died. You had a divorce that you went through. You're, you're in the middle of a bankruptcy lawyer's office trying to figure out what to do next with your life. When you're in the middle of all of that, the best testimony that I could ever have, that you could ever have to the world that does not know Jesus is that in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death, I am not going to wallow. I'm not going to focus on the thing that happened to me. Instead, instead, I am going to turn around and I'm going to praise God and I'm going to pour it out into somebody else's life because when you start to pour out what God's done in your life into somebody else's life, it changes them. The best testimony that I could ever give is not one with a microphone. The best testimony you could ever give is not one with a microphone, with a guitar. The best testimony anybody could ever give is in the middle of the biggest crap of your life, in the middle of the the worst situation in your life, in the middle of the circumstance that should have torn you to pieces. In the middle of that. It hurts. It's painful. You're mad, but you've got peace. The only way you can have that peace is when you're in the presence of your enemies. You're not focused on them. You're focused on Jesus. Because in all things, he works together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And this is your purpose, to take what you've gone through and let God use it. Nothing is wasted. Second thing, not just for people that don't know Jesus, but God wants to use what you've gone through, the enemies you've faced in your life. He wants to use that to help somebody else get through the same exact situation. See, God is, your cup has been full and and God wants to use you and you've had your husband, you lost your husband and he's gone and you, you hurt so deep and you're so mad and you feel so much pain. You, you lost a kid or, or someone did something to you that, is, that you feel like is unforgivable. They should never have done that. When that happens in my life, when that happens in your life, and we're sitting in the presence of our enemies, and you've got fill in your blank sitting right next to you all over the place, divorce, relational failure, bankruptcy, your child died. Things that that you don't just get over. Things that hurt. And you want to find peace in the middle of that situation. You want to find peace right where you are. Because God hasn't changed your circumstance. He's prepared a place for you in the presence of your enemies. When you find yourself there, when I find myself there, God wants to use you for the person that's going through what you have gone through. Because here's here's what I want you to know about your enemies. 
Your enemy that's sitting at this table, this chair right here, your enemy that's right here at the divorce lawyer's office, your enemy right there, they're just warming up the seat for the person that God is going to use to change. God is going to use you where the enemy set in your life, he's going to use you to change the person that's going through the divorce that you went through years ago. God is going to take the, the death that's in this chair. They're just warming it up for the person that God's going to bring along that you're going to impact. The person whose life you're going to change because you went through exactly what they went through and you can speak to them like no one else on planet earth. The enemy was warming up that seat for the person God's going to change through you. The, 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 the person that took advantage of you. They took advantage of you. The enemy in your life. You feel like everything is wrapped up and that that person took something from you. That enemy, let me tell you something. That enemy was just warming up the seat for how God wants to use your life. Because you are not what the enemy has told you. You are not the things that happen to you. You are what God wants to do through you. And God wants to use every single person. If you're not dead, God's not done. If you're not dead, God's not done. It may feel like the valley of the shadow of death right now. It may look like you can't see further than, than your, your arms reach. You, you may feel like you can't move anywhere. You are just surrounded by the enemy. Let me let, me let you in on a little secret. God has prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Not to give them a place to sit, but to give you a place to sit, to focus on God. When we can start to focus on the presence of God. While I can't promise you that your circumstances will change, I can promise you this. That the unexplainable, indescribable, ever-present peace of God will wash over your life. I can tell you this from experience. Some of the worst times I've ever had in my entire life, getting doctor reports, some of the worst times I've ever had in my entire life have been some of the times where I've felt the most peace from God. It's not logical. It's not explainable. It's the presence of 